So, uh, hi everyone. Um, apologize for the delay and technical problems. My name is Ashish Kutiala. I'm a director of product marketing at GitLab, and it's my pleasure here to be with Gene Kim, who is a leading research um, and research analyst and a um, author of all things DevOps. He's been, you know, doing this for many years now, and most famously, you might have read his books, uh, The Phoenix Project, as well as the new, you know, uh, DevOps Handbook. Next slide, please, Agnes. Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, in this uh, next uh, hour, I'll be presenting the highlights of the uh, State of DevOps findings. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, having some um, discussion around some of the key findings out of it. So for those of you who don't know, the uh, State of DevOps report is uh, the longest running study of its kind. It's a five-year cross-population study uh, it's now spanning 30,000 respondents. Um, and so for uh, the first four years, that was uh, done in conjunction with uh, Puppet, and this year was done in conjunction with uh, Google Cloud. So uh, the next uh, slide, Agnes, uh, the uh, goal was always to understand what does high performance look like and uh, really understand what are the uh, factors that predict uh, performance. So, <clears throat> you know, the one, uh, the first uh, comment I'll make here is that um, uh, there's another construct added in the measurement of IT performance, and it's uh, really factoring in availability. So let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, so we took a look at performance through a slightly different lens. And of course, uh, we're always looking for the practices that predict performance. Uh, so some of the key areas we looked at were monitoring and observability, uh, some more factors around continuous testing, uh, look at the practices that influence databases, which is uh, actually one of the most uh, petrifying uh, places in the uh, application stack to change. And then uh, more on security. So on the next slide, uh, we also looked at um, more uh, factors around culture. So we know that um, there are really three factors that drive uh, performance. Uh, you know, really DevOps are the conditions uh, that allow fast flow, high reliability, and it really involves architectural practices, technical practices, and cultural norms. So uh, on the next slide uh, is what we call, uh, what's always the most exciting part of the study for me, which is really understanding the uh, performance differences between high, medium, and low performers. And again, we see this massive difference between uh, the best performers uh, and uh, the not best performers. We know that high performers out of the 2018 study, um, they're doing 46 times more frequent uh, deployments. So that could be deployments of code in the application or deployments of any changes to the environment. And again, uh, they are much more uh, faster in terms of being able to go from something put into version control through integration, through testing, through deployment, so that um, customers are actually getting value. And uh, it's not just about doing more work, but uh, it's getting far better outcomes. Uh, when they do a change, high performers are seven times less likely to have the change go wrong, whether it's a service impairment, uh, a sub one outage, a security breach or a compliance failure. And when things go wrong, they can fix it 2,600 times more quickly. So uh, in, uh, this is actually really interesting. In fact, on the next slide, I should, I'll ask you for, so for a commentary on this, but if you go to the next slide, yeah, uh, here, um, you can see that uh, you know, the, the stark differences uh, between high and low performers. So, you know, Ashish, uh, we've been at this for many years. Uh, this certainly must resonate with your own experiences. No, absolutely. Um, I think I'll share a recent example. I can't name, you know, who this is. This is a large financial institution based out of New York, a global, you know, financial house. And they've started to kind of accelerate their journey towards DevOps. They were already doing this and they were able to deploy code to production once every two weeks. And they have now gone up to six times a day, if you look at that at, you know, over two weeks, that 60 deploys every two weeks instead of one deploy. So it's actually 60 times better for them than they were doing before. So it absolutely is working for those, you know, who are, who are doing this, um, uh, taking this approach and doing it right. Oh, yeah. In fact, that, was, that uh, I think reinforces so many other sort of really great findings from this year. And maybe just to set context, I mean, I think uh, five years in, you know, we always worry, you know, are we going to actually see something interesting that uh, we can actually learn from? And uh, every year there's some incredible findings. So uh, let's go to what those are on the next slide. Um, you know, for me, one of the, uh, uh, okay, one commentary is I had mentioned that we had another factor uh, in terms of uh, what uh, we used to call IT performance. We now call it software delivery uh, performance. Um, and uh, that's the, because we now are looking at uh, availability 
as well, right? So that makes sense, right? We not only want to get to market quickly, we want to be able to fix things when it goes wrong. We also want to make sure that services are actually available when customers need it. And so uh, you know, the highest performers are three and a half times more likely to have strong availability practices. So that's what we would expect. On the next slide, uh, this is um, one of the shockers for me is in the early years, the, the high performing cluster was always you know, yeah, it's, it's typically between 15% uh, and you know, it grew to make 25%. This year, uh, high performers make up 48% of the population. And so we're actually studying uh, a subset of those, uh, what we're calling the elite performers. But what is so uh, astonishing to me uh, is really twofold. One is the fact that it reinforces this lesson I learned at the Software Engineering Institute at, Car at Carnegie Mellon University is the high performers always getting better. The best are always accelerating the, away from the herd. That is absolutely true. But I think the other kind of uh, important point is that I, I think one could have actually made a case uh, that it was okay to be mediocre because everyone else was. However, <laughs> what this is showing now is that, uh, you know, high performers are almost half of the population, right? To be mediocre, we're actually behind. So I think it really makes the case that uh, uh, what was good a couple years ago is probably not good enough today. Uh, does this uh, resonate with you, Ashish? No, absolutely, Gene. I think the one example I already gave you was, you know, deploying every two weeks was already like good high performance from where they started, which was, you know, I think it was once a quarter that they were able to deploy well. And then they took it to the next level, which, you know, resonates exactly what you say here. They went from being a high performer to an elite performer. I think the key to that, we'll talk about it later in the webinar, is learning from you know, what they were doing and how to constantly improve upon that. Exactly right. Um, so on the next slide um, uh, is, ah, yeah, so this is actually now my favorite way to view um, the data. Uh, you know, I would always present kind of the, the, the 46 times higher, 2,500 times faster, uh, this is actually the more useful view for me, uh, which is really uh, for every one of the four uh, key metrics, uh, you know, you can now quickly see whether you, which cluster you're in. And again, I would focus on lead time for changes. Uh, of, of all the uh, things that I recommend people to measure to, it really is lead time. You know, how quickly can we go from something going to version control, through integration, through testing, through deployment, into production. And then all the other metrics go up and down uh, with that. So, um, uh, you know, so actually it is a version of this slide that I now uh, is my main way of presenting uh, the data. Uh, any thoughts on that, Ashish? So a question for you, maybe reserved for the end. I really like these metrics. I think a lot of, you know, customers and um, other other leaders who are deploying uh, DevOps and getting success are actually using a number of different metrics. So why these four metrics or others? If you have a brief commentary on that, or you want to talk about, you know, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, so it's going into five years of the research. Uh, in the early years, we were looking for the metrics that matter, and so uh, we tried many, many metrics, and it was actually these. It was uh, these four metrics that all correlated together, um, and. And in fact, it is these four metrics that when you combine them is actually uh, a predictive, um, is a predictor of organizational performance. So uh, why these four? <laughs> you know, the, the theory, uh, you know, it's because that's what the research showed. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the theory is, is that uh, the first two metrics are deployment frequency and lead time for changes. Those, those are agility metrics. And then the two other metrics, mean time to repair and change failure rate, those are the sort of outcome metrics or the, the stability metrics. And so they're actually kind of two orthogonal uh, axes of performance. So I find that extremely satisfying. Uh, makes a lot no, of I sense. think the key is you also said they're correlated and your explanation on how they're correlated makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, awesome. In fact, for anyone who wants to learn more about that, I would actually recommend the Accelerate book. Uh, uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, um, who is one of the three researchers that uh, we've that have been behind the study. Uh, yeah, she does a phenomenal job of explaining all of that. And it's something that I've uh, flipped through. And whenever someone asks me a very technical question that uh, needs a very uh, backed up answer, I, I take a screenshot of, uh, of that book. Um, so on the next slide, Agnes, um, one of the other uh, surprising and delightful findings was uh, the notion of cloud. So we know that platforms are important. We want developers to work self-service. Uh, so we asked uh, 
uh, a set of questions. First is, are you doing cloud? And then we asked five more questions in terms of uh, you know, the characteristics of the cloud service that they're using. Is it on demand, broad network access, resource pooling, elasticity, measured service? And it turns out this is, uh, you know, these are exactly the definitions uh, from NIST in terms of uh, their guidance on cloud computing. And so only uh, you know, one fifth of those people who said they were doing cloud actually said that they're doing all of these things, which means you know, only 22% of those people who are doing cloud computing are actually using cloud computing um, you know, as NIST defines it. But those who are using all five um, axes of uh, cloud capability were 23 times more likely to be elite performers. <laughs> so yeah, it just uh, shows uh, you know, how great it can be for dev productivity and also how easy it is to use cloud and not actually get the, the benefits uh, and not get the benefits that uh, is promised. Ashish. Um. Absolutely, we are seeing the same thing. We don't do the research as deeply as you do, but we do see the evidence that those who are using cloud are able to achieve you know, their goals of going for, I mean, if you go back to the four metrics you just talked about, we see more of those kind of being realized as people are adopting cloud more than you know, the traditional infrastructure. And these five key things that, um, you know, capabilities are absolutely spot on on you know, why you should be using cloud and how you take advantage of that. Right, uh, as opposed to just lifting and shifting things into the cloud, right? That is probably not gonna get uh, the desired benefits. Okay, Absolutely. on the next slide. Uh, oh, open source software. So uh, this I thought was uh, super interesting. So uh, teams that use open source were one point uh, nearly twice as likely to be elite performers, and uh, those same teams uh, were one and a half times more likely to expand open source uh, usage in the future. I think this is super interesting because, you know, it is, I would say, uh, almost everybody for the services and applications that we deploy into production, uh, it turns out we didn't actually write most of it, right? We are using, to a great extent, open source libraries, uh, whether it's NPM in the Node ecosystem or Maven, uh, uh, in the Java ecosystem, um, you know, Cocoa Pods in the uh, in the Apple ecosystem. So, um, uh, open source is a phenomenal um, accelerator for developer productivity. Uh, Ashish, uh, you have a lot to say about open source. I do. So, mm -hmm. Agnes, if you could go to the next slide. So, let me share a little story with you. Um, as you know, that GitLab is based on open source, and we actually have a philosophy that everybody can contribute, right? Which ties in really well with uh, the open source philosophy. But what is interesting is apart from our own engineering staff, we have about 2,200 plus external contributors actually actively contributing to our code base. And that has made us, you know, one of the highest velocity open source projects. The idea here is that everybody has an input, everybody can contribute, everybody can contribute features that they would like to see in or fix things that they would like to see and this concept of co-creation includes our customers. You know, they use our software when they actually want something that is on the roadmap, but earlier, they're actually you know, getting in there and creating this. We had one of, the, you know, one of our customers recently uh, comment to us, we are hiring GitLab developers in our staff. And we said, why? And the answer was because we want some features faster than you know, that are shipping. We ship every month. And that was just phenomenal to hear that. So if you go to the next slide, Agnes, um, I mean, just as an example, the velocity we achieve, I mean, you look, we are doing about 67 deploys a day to gitlab.com. And for the past 87 months, we have released on the 22nd of every month without fail. And this is, you know, definitely um, a, a big thank you to all our co-contributors. The fact that it's open source, it's transparent and everybody can contribute. Next slide, Agnes. And just to give a flavor of you know, how this is working for us, if you look at you know, the, the product improvement that we have in our own product, it's an exponential rise. You know, as more and more people have started contributing, as you know, customers have gotten in, just look at that you know, phenomenal hockey stick effect and how fast the product is evolving and adding features. So this is a good example of when you collaborate with everybody, when you let everybody co contribute and co-author, how, how fast does it do that? So next slide, Agnes. <laughs> I 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it is just uh, uh, amazing just how it, uh, this open source can lead to incredibly different uh, development models than you know, we've been traditionally accustomed to. Uh, thank you, Ashish. And so uh, another, uh, uh, to reinforce something that you said is that uh, DevOps and high performance is not restricted to any industry. Uh, certainly not restricted just to the fangs, the Facebooks, Amazon, Netflix, and Googles. It is for across every industry vertical. And so although we've had, uh, we've been able to show pie charts over the last five years to say, hey, um, uh, DevOps and high performance is across almost every industry vertical, is independent of company size, um, or even profit or not for profit. Uh, you know, that was more, uh, we, we couldn't actually show that uh, in a statistically significant way. No, we just didn't gather the data in a way that was possible. This year, however, uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, uh, she actually went through and uh, showed that industry absolutely doesn't matter. There is actually no industry uh, that uh, is exempt from high performance, whether it's regulated or non-regulated. So uh, that's actually a very strong claim we can make now is that, uh, you know, uh, high performance is, is possible everywhere. Um, and so that's actually a really uh, neat uh, find to actually now put into, uh, into the community and the literature. Uh, the next slide um, is about, uh, ah, yes, uh, the, data, the technical practice around databases. Um, you know, I think just from uh, my perspective, uh, if you take a look at the typical application stack, um, application, data, operating systems, networking, you know, firewall, you know, I, you've seen this kind of revolution in terms of uh, how we um, around automation and sort of the, the uh, using the same sort of technical practices that we're using development, extending across the entire value stream, except for databases. <laughs> the databases were always very scary uh, to change. Uh, and I think it's because of the irreversible nature of those changes. Uh, and the fact that, you know, when you're doing schema changes, you know, you could actually, uh, you know, uh, there's certain operations <laughs> that you think will take minutes, but actually take hours. So uh, that's always very petrifying. And uh, one of the findings is that all the technical practices are equally applicable for the database as well. Um, and so we're actually on the next slide, I guess. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, it, of course, uh, there's no way that uh, we can actually increase the number of deployments without causing carnage and disruption if we weren't actually integrating testing into daily work. Um, the next slide. Oh, yeah, um, Ashish. I think, Gene, I just wanted to reinforce, you know, from another um, respected analyst from Gartner, in a recent paper where, you know, they talk about hacking your culture to drive quality and DevOps success. Um, it's really about the feedback mechanisms, right? You want to make sure that you're investing in the right places. And really how you can do this by, is by having, you know, automated testing, automate, 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 and give developers the confidence, you know, as soon as you can, that what they're doing is right. <clears throat> and how do you, you know, whether you want to keep working on that or whether you need to change your direction and do something else, the, the feedback earlier you get, we, we all know this in DevOps, it really works. Yeah, right. In fact, uh, that's been one of my learnings, you know, as I'm spending more and more time uh, writing code is that the fast feedback uh, is uh, yeah. even six minutes is too long. You know, to be able to bring that down to seconds is like night and day in terms of uh, how you feel about daily work. Um, slide 23 um, is about observability and uh, monitoring. So uh, again, this reinforces another finding um, about hey, you have to have pro proactive production telemetry. Um, and so we had looked at two things around uh, uh, monitoring uh, and then observability. Uh, we uh, went into the observability community uh, as a kind of a new space and tried to uh, uh, see how that would impact performance. And, you know, elite performers were nearly 1.5 times more likely. Uh, teams that put great observability monitoring uh, in place uh, were 1.5 times more likely to be a high performer. Uh, this makes sense. It reinforces uh, previous year's findings. Uh, to me, it, that's, you know, pretty obvious, right? I mean, uh, you can't fix an outage if you can't see what you're doing, right? But uh, another kind of interesting fact is that... Uh, uh, we had two instruments, monitoring and observability. They actually loaded together. So that uh, really means that uh, as a two distinct sets of practices, they really do go 
if you're doing one, you're doing the other, right? Uh, so we haven't been able to split those yet uh, in terms of two distinct sets of practices. So uh, maybe that's uh, work for next year. Um, next slide. Uh, oh, yes. So um, this is what's called a uh, structural equation model. So this is actually one of my favorite diagrams uh, in, that's come out of the study because what this shows is uh, every time you see an arrow, that is a predictive causal factor. So that means that, uh, for example, deployment automation does uh, help with the achievement of continuous delivery, which in turn does increase effectiveness of SDO performance, which does uh, predict uh, an increase in performance of organizational performance. Um, and so everything that is in bold and capital letters, uh, those are new instruments. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, these are just fantastic, um, you know, boy, there's no better diagram than this to sort of say how all the pieces fit together. Uh, and so that's the, uh, one of my most cited um, diagrams. And uh, in fact, uh, in other diagrams, you'll see on the left of this, there'll be actually leadership uh, because leadership amplifies uh, so much of these, you know, at this point, technical practices. On the next slide um, uh, are, is another aspect of uh, uh, the structure equation model, uh, which is you know the need for organizational learning. So one of the practices that increase climate for learning is having retrospectives. Um, so that simultaneously increases climate for learning as well as uh, increasing, uh, uh, you know, generative culture that is measured by the Westrom instrument. So the Westrom, Dr. Westrom found nearly uh, 12 years ago that uh, uh, healthcare safety, patient safety and healthcare organizations was uh, highly in predicted by uh, organizational culture. And then he had three categories, uh, pathological cultures that uh, hid bad news, punished uh, people telling bad news, kind of uh, was averse to seeking new information. You had bureaucratic cultures uh, that tried to create uh, a merciful organization. And then at the other extreme, you had uh, generative cultures that actively seek um, uh, uh, bad news. We train messengers to tell bad news and we're always looking for novel ideas to solve problems. So, so retrospectives helps with the achievement of helping create uh, generative cultures, which in turn uh, influences and predicts organizational performance. Next slide. Um, and uh, the, uh, let's see, where's the, the arrow here? Uh, you're right, giving teams autonomy. Um, also, we found helps increase trust and voice. So trust is to what extent do people trust the system, trust leadership, um, uh, voices, uh, uh, to what extent do people feel that their concerns are heard, uh, that uh, people care, right? And again, these two in turn drive organizational culture, which again drive organizational performance. So uh, I, I love this just because it, it matches so well with the, um, the work of Simon Sinek, uh, right? Uh, the, the work of uh, um, uh, the MIT researcher who uh, talks about, you know, uh, what people really want is autonomy and mastery, right? Uh, so it, it uh, really, um, I think, reinforces those notions. Um, next slide. Is, uh, aha, right, misguided performers. All right, so this is, uh, I'm not sure, oh, hey, uh, before we go there, uh, did you want to talk about this? So let's go misguided performers and then, uh, Ashish, I'd love to actually hear you talk yeah. about minimum viable change. So, um, misguided performance. So, one of the things that we found uh, was a super kind of interesting cluster in the low performing category. So, these are the ones that have a low deployment frequency, an extremely high lead time for changes, and low deployment failures. But there were also the ones that had the longest MTTRs, um, where you had uh, MTTR is reported between one to six months. So uh, this is super interesting, right? Because what it, uh, the conjecture here is that these are organizations that are trying to be very super slow, super cautious, but, uh, but they're also getting the worst, uh, most protracted outages. And so before you laugh at the notion of like, does anyone, can really anyone have an outage for one to six months? Uh, that actually happens a lot more than one would think. 
uh, for example, like whenever you screw up the database, right, uh, you often can get the service back up and running, but you are, you know, we were spending weeks, you know, trying to restore data, uh, uh, do direct data edits, right? Uh, we've actually corrupted data. You know, it takes weeks to restore. Um, you know, healthcare.gov is another example. That's probably a spectacular example. But, you know, uh, there's, there's an entire category of incidents where from the outside it looks fine, but uh, it does take the organization uh, weeks or even months to restore uh, what we would call normal operations. So uh, this is interesting because it says that slow and cautious uh, has a uh, potentially uh, hidden dark side where they're actually the ones that are suffering from the worst outages. So um, just another reason why, you know, uh, fat, more frequent deployments uh, with more, uh, with more of the technical practice, right, is definitely better than, than this. Um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, actually, I feel like this is actually misplaced. Uh, really, this is all about the notion of, uh, oh, 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 I see, I, I get it, right? Tell us about the philosophy, uh, a totally different philosophy of making changes. So just as you were saying, you know, big, large batches get complicated, take not only more time to get there, but if something goes wrong, it's actually extremely hard to fix it. <laughs> Long lead time. But guess what? Also, you get to know of the feedback only when the large batch reaches out there in production. So our philosophy here is we break down minimum viable product that everybody's heard of it, into minimum viable feature and then further into minimum viable change, minimum viable change. And the idea here is that if you can ship something to production, which is better than what you have today, you ship it, you test it, you ship it. And so in, in one of our previous slides, we saw that we do about 67, 66.8 deploys per day on our you know, GitLab um, platform. And, and the benefit of this is you know, multifold. We talked about you know, if something is not there out in production, you cannot get feedback. So that is you know, one result. The other one is, you know, it reduces the complexity of the large batch changes that you exactly talked about. So it is really hard to kind of like think about shipping a minimum viable change versus, you know, a completely functioning feature or a product. But, you know, we've been doing this for the past four years or five years. And we see that this not only adds to the velocity, but also the smaller batch changes and the feedback loops really help us make our product better. So... Yeah, I'll leave it at that. We'll discuss more with the Q&A. <laughs> Super. Um, on the next uh, slide um, is actually, that's, uh, let's skip this. Unless if, uh, you want to talk to this, Ashish. No, I think we can skip this one. Okay. Um, all right. Here's another uh, interesting finding. Uh, so low performing teams were four times more likely to use functional outsourcing than elite teams. <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting, right? And so by functional outsourcing, we mean, you know, this is where we take uh, all, you know, we might outsource uh, all of development to one group, outsource QA to another group, outsource uh, operations for to yet another group, and hey, just to make things interesting, we'll outsource security to yet a totally different function. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the logic of this um, is, you know, this is a way to help preserve accountability, <laughs> uh, you know, to all the parties. And yet, I think what, in all our experiences, what we found is that it becomes very difficult to push changes quickly through the entire value stream when everyone, uh, you know, when every coordination and interaction requires an account manager, potentially lawyers, <laughs> you know, contractual change fees and so forth. Um, and, and so this is not to say that outsourcing is it. Uh, makes it impossible to do DevOps. In fact, uh, you know, I think it's actually been shown that you, if you take all, uh, if you have uh, outsourced teams that own dev, QA, and operations, you can actually get great outcomes there, right? But, but what does not work uh, is uh, purely functional outsourcing. So uh, you know, uh, that was a super, super interesting uh, finding. Uh, other major takeaways on the next slide and on the next slide. Uh, ways to improve SDO performance, uh, slide 33. Um, yeah, so here are the key takeaways. Um, they, again, the difference between high and low uh, are uh, increasing and uh, continuing to increase. Uh, you know, the, the, 
ways to achieve high performance are now getting more and more clear. I mean, it is definitely, you need great architecture, you need great technical practices, uh, you need the right cultural norms, uh, leadership is important. Um, yeah, I think uh, those organizations where, uh, you know, we have those outsourcing practices where we spread out work between different teams and make it very difficult for them to work together. Uh, that is uh, probably not a winning bet. And, you know, it is, again, so gratifying for five years in a row, uh, we can see that it is possible to, you know, go more quickly uh, and do things in a safer, more reliable way and also uh, preserve availability objectives as well. Uh, on the next slide, um, here on the instructions to download the full state of DevOps report, uh, you just go to uh, that link there. Maybe we can uh, paste that into the, uh, uh, the Q&A channel as well. And I want to acknowledge uh, the team that has been behind all three years of, uh, three years, five years of uh, the state of DevOps report. That's Dr. Nicole Forsgren, uh, who is the principal investigator on this, uh, Jez Humble, and myself. And um, uh, if you're interested in uh, this body of work, I would definitely recommend uh, the Accelerate book. It, it goes into marvelous detail about the science, the causal relationships, and uh, this, the statistical evidence uh, that shows uh, the effectiveness of all these practices. And on the next slide, I want to acknowledge Google Cloud for uh, helping underwrite uh, this work, the continuation of a five-year journey saying high performers, and of course, GitLab, uh, who has been a, a phenomenal supporter as well. So uh, with that, um, yeah, uh, Ashish, I want to turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, Gene. Um, Agnes, to the next slide after this, please. Wanna, yes, thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what um, GitLab actually does and what value it provides. So, you know, we've looked across the landscape um, of how teams are trying to solve for DevOps and adopt DevOps. And we found that there's a lot of fragmentation of tools and a lot of the challenges that Gene talked about here as well. So what we have done is we've built one single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. So from planning all the way to monitoring, and these are some of the key features that, that we provide. But the difference here is you don't need to integrate anything. You can if you want to integrate with external tools that you might be using, but you can do it all from one single application. So what's the advantage of that? Agnes, um, next slide, please. So because of the fact that we have built it from the ground up as a single application, it provides many different advantages to the you know, different teams working to implement DevOps. So it's a single conversation, which is a key tenant you know, that you want to have in DevOps. Everybody working on the same work in progress you know, work, having one conversation around it, not in fragmented silos. So you are having conversational development practices implemented, you have one single data source or the single source of truth is in one place. A single interface leads to a lot of other advantages such as you know, one data model, the governance and security becomes easier. It's a single permission model. You have analytics that you can do in one place. Most importantly here, what we find is that team collaboration is really, really you know, great. It, it increases a lot because it is not easy today to take large enterprises who are divided into different teams and to put them all in one team and say, go work on this project. So how can you still have them in different teams, but force them to, or you know, have, them to have them collaborate from a single place? Because this is a single application, in one merge request, you see the testing team, you see the security team, you see the monitoring team, everyone see the same things. So it's one conversation. And we're finding that you know, our customers are adopting more and more features off this application in one place. They may start with you know, the source code management, they may then you know, incorporate the continuous integration capabilities, but the, as they adopt more, they're finding that they can accelerate up to 200% faster uh, for their DevOps lifecycle. Next slide, please, Agnes. So this was just to you know, um, give a sense of what uh, we can do. One of the features that we have here in GitLab that we've built is auto DevOps. And simply put, it is what it does. It, it, it is what it says, automatic, in auto, auto DevOps. So the idea here is with, you know, two clicks, you can provision your infrastructure. In this case, you know, it could be Kubernetes. Drop your code into um, GitLab and it'll automatically scan what language it is. Merge it, build it, 
you know, test it, go through all security testing, package and deploy this and start monitoring it. Um, imagine, you know, having to do this across separate tools, stitching this together, trying to bring all the teams together. So you can see, you know, how you, all you can have your developers do is actually focus on writing the code that builds value for the company and not actually have to focus on the underlying tools, integrations, you know, patches, et cetera. Get your development team to focus on creating value for the company that drives revenue. Next slide, please. And, you know, Gene talked about this. I think it's very obvious that the future direction is cloud native. It is, you know, going towards the cloud and adopting those five practices that we talked about. With that in mind, you know, GitLab is built for cloud native. So you don't have to do much. We have integrations with Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Cloud platforms, and, you know, once it's configured, all you do, like I said, was, you know, point and click, and it'll configure for you, manage for you. All you have to write, do is focus on your code. Next slide, please. And you know this is this is catching traction. I know we skipped the slide, but you know we we have an adoption of more than hundred thousand organizations with millions of users actually using GitLab. Highly encourage you to you know go take a look, download it, try it, and there's a free version that has you know almost ninety percent of what we offer, and. Um, Give it a spin and, and let us know how you like it. Next slide, please. So Gene, uh, over to you. You are organizing a and hosting a summit coming up, uh, <laughs> which yeah. I'm a big fan. So <laughs> love for you to you know talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just uh, very briefly. Yeah. So uh, my area of passion is really studying how DevOps is being used by large, uh, complex organizations, and so. Uh, the prime mechanism to learn about this is uh, by this uh, conference I've been running for uh, five years now, the DevOps Enterprise Summit. And so uh, our fifth year in the uh, US is now uh, being held uh, in less than a week and a half uh, in Las Vegas. So uh, you know, if you're interested in seeing uh, technology leaders uh, elevating the state of the practice in some of the most uh, uh, recognized brands across every industry vertical, uh, you know, this is a place to be and uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you there um, in a week and a half. And by the way, again, I would uh, love to thank GitLab for your phenomenal support over the years and Ashish, your personal support over the years as well. I am a big fan of this uh, summit. Look forward to being there again. And then, uh, yeah, is that the, uh, the last slide? So uh, we have questions. Should we just uh, jump in? Absolutely. So I'll moderate the questions, uh, Gene, and have you answer them. And um, you know, I can add color commentary to that. But the first question here is, Gene and Ashish, are there any examples in IoT that have stood out to you as high performers or elite performers? In IoT, yeah, so yeah, this is an area that uh, I don't know a lot about, uh, but I'm one is I'm actually uh, interested in. In fact, I'm just uh, kind of frankly surprised at uh, what is being categorized as uh, IoT, Internet of Things. I, I saw this amazing talk. Um, uh, by someone from Chick-fil-A where uh, it was actually, they were using Kubernetes to manage all the point of sale devices. And they were classifying that as a, an edge device slash IOT, which is not something that uh, I'm accustomed to hearing. But uh, you know, I think that is, I guess, the way the industry is starting to treat edge devices. Um, and I, I, you know, the notion that you have uh, thousands of point of sale devices out there now managing this massive uh, Kubernetes cluster is absolutely fascinating. And so, you know, uh, I think all the practices that uh, Kubernetes encourages, right, immutability, automated deployments, uh, you know, uh, um, certainly probably automated testing as well, um, you know, the guaranteed consistency across environments, the monitoring that comes in, I mean, I think it's just uh, fascinating. So uh, uh, let me see if I can find a link to that. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, I always equated IoT with like small little sensor devices or PLCs that go inside of industrial equipment. You know, if you broaden the category of IoT to point of sale devices, uh, suddenly, um, yeah, boy, I think there must be a lot of, uh, you see a lot of interesting things happening in that space. Let me find that um, link. And While you find it. that, Gene, you know, I'd like to share an example, which is a little bit different, but if you consider satellites out there in space being internet you know, devices, um, we have a, we have a, we have a large customer, um, it's a space agency and, and they actually not only use GitLab to what they call launch rockets. You know, they use the software to do that, but they're actually looking at, and they're deploying software 
onto their satellites that are orbiting the, the Earth using it lab. So they are doing DevOps. They are, you know, actually deploying this out there in space. Um, it's, 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 it's an extreme example of IoT, but, you know, uh, we've seen that. And while you look for that, um, I'll go to the next question. Um, and Ashish, I just posted it into the chat window. Um, Agnes, if you could copy that into the Q&A. Um, yeah. Oh, let's see. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, you can just do that. Uh, okay. do it. Um, so the next question is, as you know, um, we look at this is, um, it's a question that says, how do you qualify minimum viable change mm. and their related features? How can autonomous teams maintain alignment with the MVCs and the MVFs? So on our side, you know, I'll start and then, you know, see what, what you want to add color to that. But we explicitly name something in MVC when we can plan it. If you can't reduce it further, it probably qualifies as such. So the alignment is just same as the other workflows, right? I mean, you have to make sure that your MVC proposal is easily readable, understandable, and, and independent. Yeah, that's such an intriguing thing, right? Because I think the, the theory says is that you want to, um, the theoretical ideal in manufacturing um, for lean is single piece flow, right? And, and so sometimes it's called one, one by one flow. That means uh, batch size of one, inventory of one. And uh, so that's almost like an assembly line. And so that means that you want to reduce the batch size to the lowest possible thing. And it's a very startling notion of MVC because it sounds like uh, it really that creates a pressure to reduce the size of the change down to the, the uh, as you said, the, the smallest change possible, right? which is actually theoretically, right, the safest type of change. Um, and uh, I think that is a, a practice that I think is an answer to a tough question, which is how, how do you sort of, do big features in a way that they can fit inside of a reasonable development interval. So it often it takes a, a different product planning discipline to be able to define the feature in a way where it can be done in small chunks. So it sounds like the MVC is an extreme example of that and uh, one that's obviously uh, very effective for GitLab. So that's very, very cool. Thanks, Gene. Um, moving on to the next question, um, I'll pick on this one. We are on our DevOps journey. We are seeing a lot of benefits like you highlighted. So Gene, that's you. Uh, do you have any ideas? Uh, do you do you have any ideas to help onboard a traditional quality team to see the DevOps way? Ah, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, so this is going to sound like a uh, not a, a a crazy, not helpful answer, but it is one of the most profound things I've ever heard in my career. Uh, this actually came from a mentor of mine, uh, Elizabeth Hendrickson. She pioneered. Um, um, so much of quality engineering over the last uh, decade and a half. And uh, she told me about the, the, uh, the Los Altos workshop for software testing. So they, this is where they assembled the best QA people in the game. And, uh, you know, among the 60 workshops they did, one workshop, they actually did one exercise that went like this. What was the dev to QA ratio for your best project and your worst project? And so for the worst project, um, it was actually the ones with the highest dev QA ratios, right? Sometimes, you know, unity, one-to-one. -one. Um, for people's best projects, one answer came up uh, over and over again. And uh, the, the answer was, for our best project, we had no testers. <laughs> so so uh, this is coming from QA professionals, the best in the game. And so Elizabeth is telling me the lesson for her was that you often end up with the best quality when everybody knows that there is no one out there who's going to find your problems for you. <laughs> so, so it's not saying that QA is not important. QA is absolutely important, but we need it to be fully owned by the developers. It can't be someone else's job. I think what it means is that uh, the job of QA then becomes, uh, is not about testing other people's code. Instead, it is how do we take those quality engineering principles and integrated into all the daily work of the developers. In fact, one, one, just, one last little comment. Uh, a couple of years ago in the State of DevOps report, we found this kind of very peculiar finding is that the more, uh, we asked this question on a scale of one to seven, to what extent are developers responsible for maintaining the acceptance test uh, suite? And uh, the less developers owned it, the worse the outcomes. So again, I think the role of uh, 
QA is uh, not doing the work, but it's helping kind of integrate security into how developers do work. And so, you know, I think the uh, it means that you know they need to be technical, they need to be uh, you know familiar with code, and even better if they can code. And you know, I think that's a uh, that is I think a genuine challenge for um, you know many QA professionals, Ashish. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Um, we're seeing the same thing. I've seen it for a number of years. Like, you know, I've been with this field and it's, 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 it's I think more teams are buying into it and uh, we see it getting better. Um, going on to the next question, Gene, I'll pick this one. How often are DevOps practices seen within the healthcare industry? <laughs> so, um, well, you know, in fact, one of the talks at DevOps Enterprise is from Alice Reyes. She's uh, VP of Digital at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, they've actually presented numerous times. Uh, Alice Reyes presented this for now for the second year. And you actually do see, uh, actually at Kaiser, they actually did a, they transformed uh, the patient provider portal. <laughs> so this is in some ways probably the most shocking area of which you would do DevOps on, right? This is where all the PII is. This is where, you know, you have all the, uh, the sensitive communications between the patients and the healthcare providers. Um, Alice Ray is talking about how they're uh, now elevating the technical practices within the pharmacy group. Uh, yeah, so you know, absolutely. Um, again, I would go to the uh, further motivate that through the uh, latest finding that industry does not matter. And uh, holy cow, of all the places where we want faster, safer, cheaper, happier, <laughs> right? It's healthcare, right? Where we're not just talking about economic. Um, gain, but we're also talking about, you know, improving the societal outcomes for, uh, for everybody. So uh, absolutely. Um, and there's evidence points. Uh, we have great experience reports from the healthcare industry and, 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 and hopefully more. In fact, uh, I just got to spend a day yesterday. One of the people who really is one of the most, my favorite people to study is Heather Mickman, who really uh, co-led the DevOps movement at Target. She's now doing the same thing now at Optum Healthcare, which is uh, you know, a two hundred fifty billion dollar market cap company. Uh, I think it's a Fortune five company. Um, so, you know, I expect great things. <laughs> you know, from uh, uh, from Optum. So, uh, thank you, Gene, for that. Um, I'll go back to one question that I missed. It was actually the first question. Um, so, Chris asks, "Do you have any tips for promoting retrospectives in a team culture that is otherwise <laughs> eager to adopt agile dev practices?" Um, it seems like our teams are not willing to try it out either for fear of giving or receiving negative feedback or the extra meeting added into their busy schedules. Do you have any, <laughs> any <comments on> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. So um, I guess three things come to mind. One is, you know, if they're uh, eager to adopt agile um, practices, you know, then, you know, part of the agile, one of the more well-known agile rituals is the uh, daily stand-up, right? So, uh, you know, it's 15 minutes, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, people see the value of that. Um, basically, I would, um, you know, uh, just try adding a 30-minute retrospective to the end of each interval, uh, whether it's the end of the scrum or whatever. I mean, there's got to be something uh, like that, um, you know, to basically, you know, uh, evaluate, you know, um, how did we do against our goals, you know, for this, you know, for this week or, you know, every two weeks or whatever the interval is. Um, and then I would uh, gently add, uh, you know, something to the agenda of that, which is uh, what are the things that went wrong, um, especially if it led to a production incident, uh, because those are as relevant, maybe even more important, you know, than, you know, any difficulties had during the, you know, the, the design and development process. So, you know, I would, uh, I would, find out all the sort of existing agile practices that the teams are using, and then just gently slip in, uh, you know, things into the uh, existing retrospectives uh, and even maybe uh, integrate some uh, blameless postmortem section into the agenda. Uh, and I think you'll find uh, no, um, I think you'll find uh, a, a grateful group of people uh, as a result of doing that. I think you, you hit upon something that I was, um, going to also say, make sure that the retros are blameless, right? And this comes from our VP of product who leads, you know, our retrospective. So we do a live YouTube streaming every release, every month of, you know, what we release on the 22nd of every month. So those readers here who would love to take, um, to, to, to see how we do it, you know, it's streamed live. So it's in front of everybody. And, um, you know, some of the key rules are make sure that the retrospectives are blameless. Make sure you go in with a mindset of continuous improvement. 
But most importantly that, you know, you have to make sure that you're giving clear feedback that helps the person that you're giving it to. And those three tips come from, you know, you our VP of product, you know, who leads a lot of these retrospectives. And of course, you know, we invite you to come and see ours and learn from it if you would like. Um, also, I think Etsy has like really good perspectives on, and guide on, you know, how do they do retrospectives? <laughs> a, uh, the, the level of transparency uh, is always amazing at GitLab. <laughs> has a, uh, that is a fact. I need to send you an invitation to our next retrospective. I think it would be fun <laughs> for you to watch. Excellent. Um, so there was a follow-up question on the MVC. Do you have good examples of an MVC proposal? And um, I think a good example is when we introduced Epix, uh, the concept of Epix into GitLab. And our first iteration was nothing but just a title and all the linked issues underneath it. It didn't do anything else. There were no notifications, system notes, or any other capability. Right. We shipped that out as epics. And then we came back and we added, you know, more capabilities with these release. Um, any comments on that, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it could be as simple as I'm going to add a new screen that lets you create a new epic and uh, just have a text field. <laughs> and that, that could be uh, the, a minimal viable change uh, that helps with the achievement of a better way to organize, you know, actual issues, cards, so on and so forth. Uh, would that be uh, uh, an acceptable MVC, Ashish? I think it would be. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So um, I have an interesting question for you, Gene. Um, is there a good DevOps best practice you would recommend? Maybe a book? Maybe a reference? <laughs> I don't know, Gene. Is there any books you would recommend people read? <laughs> yeah, you know, in fact, I would uh, recommend the, the DevOps Handbook. I mean, it, is, uh, it was five and a half years in the making, and it was the goal just to really sort of create the prescriptive guide of what are the principles and practices, you know, to help uh, uh, with to achieve you know, the levels of performance that uh, we've been talking about. And uh, for those of you who are interested in the research, to really dive deep into understanding why. Um, the causal links between these behaviors and outcomes, uh, that would be the Accelerate book. Um, so uh, those are uh, my, uh, uh, it's kind of weird saying this as one of the co-authors of both books, but I mean, it's, those are, uh, I, I'm so proud to be associated with all of those books. Just to keep it neutral, um, there are books written by, you know, ex-practitioners and executives that also provide a different insight as to what challenges they went through as they actually, you know, implemented these large scale changes. And I, you know, I love the handbook and I, in Accelerate, I just read it, but I would also recommend reading books by somebody who's also, you know, written a book about their experience. Excellent. So, uh, oh. last, uh, sorry. Oh, no, okay, I'll keep going. Um, we have question, time for one more question, which I will um, pick up, which is, can you talk about AI, ML, which is machine learning and big data as it pertains to GitLab? Um, I think, you know, I would like to um, say, you know, follow up on that answer, you know, not in the specific area of DevOps, but I did want to ac acknowledge that question. And, you know, uh, I'll send you my email. I'm happy to kind of have a follow-up conversation on that. I did want to make sure that we addressed it. Um, I think those are all the questions that we had. And I'd like, like to thank you, Gene, very much for sharing your research data with us and adding commentary to that. Um, very useful. It's built on, you know, five years of research. It's getting better every year as I see it. Um, thank you very much for sharing your time. Um, yeah, thank you again to uh, you, Ashish, and uh, all of GitLab for the support on the study, and uh, see you in a week and a half at DevOps Enterprise. I'll see you there. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, Agnes, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the great questions. So I'm going to close it up. Um, We'd like to invite you to sign up for a free trial of GitLab Ultimate. So we're excited to see what your team can do with it. I'll chat that link. Um, and that's all for today. Thank, Thank you, Agnes. For joining Thank us. you. Bye. Bye.